Scheduling web servers is not that different from scheduling processes in an OS, but it's somewhat different. How is it different from an OS scheduler when you're scheduling and you're all hopefully fairly deep into figuring out how to schedule a web server for problem set three? How is that different from scheduling processes in an operating system? Yes, energy is not a factor. Um, so certainly for problem set three, you're not asked to think about energy. In terms of a real web server, is energy a factor? So it definitely is. So if you look at the costs of operating a data center, energy is probably the, the largest single cost now. So that is something people running big data centers, running big web, web services, pay a lot of attention to. Yes. OK, good. Yeah, so the web schedule, you've got requests coming in from outside on the, the OS. Well, you might have some events coming in from outside, but all the programs are programs that started to run on that machine. One of them can be a web server, so certainly these things are pretty intertwined. The fact that the requests are coming from outside also changes what your goal is. So if you're, you own a machine, you want to schedule it to get the most value for the owner of that machine. If your machine is serving external users, well, then the metrics that you might want to pick might be different. You're not trying to serve just one user. You've got all these users, and you want to figure out some way to maximize the value that your service is providing or the value of your business or whatever, the reason that you're running this web server. Because those requests are coming from outside, they can exceed the cap capacity of your server. You can get incoming requests at a rate that is faster than the rate that your server can process those requests. That can lead to bad things happening. What do you have to do? So if you're getting requests faster than you can serve them, what are your options? OK, so you could keep all the requests and keep serving them in order. Are you ever going to catch up if the rates stay the same? You're never going to catch up. If the requests keep coming in faster than you can serve them, you're never going to catch up because as you serve a request, more requests have come in. OK, good. Yeah, so you could try to figure out ways to increase this. If you can increase the rate that your server can handle requests, then maybe you can keep up with the rate of requests coming in. If you can't do that, you've got to decide something about which request you're going to handle. Okay. Until you scale up your server rate, there's no way you can keep up with this without dropping some of the requests. So that's part of what your scheduler might have to do is decide which request to drop. Your real goal, assuming you want to serve all the requests, is to increase the rate that you can process requests. So how do we increase the rate that our server can process requests? And you mentioned, I think, a couple ideas already. What are different things we might do to increase the rate the server can handle requests? Caching? OK, good. So if we can make it so we have to do less work for each, each request, what else could we do? Uh, yes. Parallelize. OK. Get more resources. Yes. OK, yeah. So if we can. Get more resources. And that could be parallelizing. That could be getting more machines and being able to divide the traffic between those machines. It could be just getting our one machine that we're not able to parallelize, making that more powerful. What should we do before we start exploring any of these solutions? How do we know which to do? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. So the first thing we have to do is understand where the time is going. If we don't have a way to measure things, we don't know what's going to work. This is our first solution. If we can't measure things and understand where the time is going, where the resources are going, solutions like caching are probably almost always useful. But we don't know if that's going to solve our problem. We don't know which are the right things to cache. So measurement is always where we should start. So that's going to be strategy number zero, is to measure things. We're going to use healthcare.gov as our example. It's really a site that, when it launched, was massively under capable of serving all the requests it was getting. It was not getting a, a really high number of requests relative to big web services today, but was getting far more than it could. And there's a great article in the latest issue of Time. Ah, I, do have a, I do have a paper copy, so you can believe that it's actually on the cover, talking about how to fix a web server. I'm not just making this up. There's a fair bit of this that's, that's about the political side and how to do project management, which is also quite interesting. It doesn't get a lot into the technical side, but does mention some of these things. And the first thing that the team that they, they brought in to solve this noticed that the, the original team that built it, which were sort of traditional government contractors, and they brought in 
people from Silicon Valley who knew how to actually make big web services, the first thing that they noticed was there was no way to measure what was going on. That there was no, what they call a dashboard, some way to easily see how many requests you're getting, where the time is going, how long it's taking per request. So without some way to measure, you really don't know what's going on and you don't know whether you're fixing the right things. So that was definitely the first thing to do and it didn't take too long to build at least a, a starting dashboard to understand what was going on. We're not talking too much about benchmarking in this class. You're using HTTP perf for problem set three. Your goal in a benchmark is to figure out where you should spend your time. In some sense, what you're doing for problem set three is a little bit backward because we have specific problems telling you to do specific things, some of which can have a really big impact on performance, others of which might not. That's really the wrong way to drive if you're trying to build a system to have good performance, you should be doing the measuring first and figuring out what to do from that rather than having a set of things that you think are gonna be useful and trying them. In some sense, what you're doing for problem set three is backwards. Hopefully you won't be misled by that. Once you are measuring things, well, you certainly wanna measure the impact of changes. Oftentimes a change that seems like a good idea might actually make things slower. If you have a good benchmark, you have confidence that the benchmark tells you whether your change improved things. Having a good benchmark is tough. One of the dangers in benchmarks is if you're using a benchmark and it doesn't represent real traffic well, you're gonna optimize your service for that benchmark and that doesn't mean it's gonna work well in the real conditions that you want it to work for. The other thing benchmarks can be useful for if you do need to launch a site the way they launched healthcare.gov, which very few sites should launch by going from nothing to open to the whole world and getting massive traffic at once. But sometimes sites need to do that to have some way to try to predict in advance what you're gonna need to scale. We're not gonna go into a lot of details in this class about how to do benchmarking well. It's definitely a challenging thing to do well. Anytime you're trying to do optimizations, if you don't have good benchmarks, good ways of measuring it, you could well be wasting your time. Assuming we've got a measurement, so one of the strategies no one mentioned, and it's understandable why you didn't mention this, is to simplify the content. This is something that often you might not have as an option. Right? If you're developing Apache, you don't control the content that people are using your web server for. For problem set three, you don't really control the content either. But for real services, certainly for healthcare.gov, but for lots of real services, you do control the content as well. The best example I know of this is from September 11th. So this is what the New York Times site looked like captured from archive.org. The first capture they had before September 11th was September 5th. This is what it looked like on September 11th. What are the things they did to simplify the content? So they're getting a huge amount of traffic, far more than they would normally expect on September 11th. Can you see things they did? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so they, they removed a lot of junk. They removed all of this stuff. They removed all of this stuff, right? And this is expensive stuff to generate. This is probably things that actually require running a lot of code to generate. What else did they do? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, so they did remove headlines. I don't see, actually see ads on either page, which is kind of odd. That may be because I had ad block running when I visited them. Although the archive sites, I'm not sure if they would block ads. Yes. Good. Yeah, that's a little harder to see, but they, instead of serving a big image, they're serving just plain text. If you look at the code for the website, that's exactly what they did. The image, what would normally be the fancy logo, they replaced with plain text. You can see there's still plenty of cruft that if they really wanted to simplify it, they probably didn't need all these spacer images, but those are probably small locally cached images. So there are lots of things you can do to simplify the content. The other thing that you couldn't see from that picture is what was on the rest of the page. So I cut off that picture at the top so you can at least see the top. If you scaled it so you can see the whole page, this is the difference in the size of the page. That's a pretty extreme example, but that's certainly something that most web designers and people that are playing with big graphics and the kinds of fancy scripts and fancy UI stuff they had on healthcare.gov that weren't really necessary, if those are the things that you have some control over and you need to quickly improve performance, those are probably the easiest things to cut down on. If we don't have control over the content, we can save a lot of effort by caching, which was suggested and which you're doing for problem set three. Why is caching important? Yes, good, yeah, because IO is expensive. So the things that are really expensive, these are Peter Norvig's numbers for this, which are certainly very different today, but probably relatively not that different. 
the time it takes to find a location on a disk is 8 million nanoseconds. That is an awful lot more than the time it takes to fetch from main memory, which is an awful lot more than the time it takes to fetch from your local cache. In terms of what's changed today, so the servers that you're running on EC2, I'm not positive that this is the case for the free tier servers, but all the non-free tier servers. How has this changed since 2001? Is the disk seek still 8 million nanoseconds? What kind of disk do you have in your laptop? Yeah. Yeah. Most laptops today and all the servers on any, uh, I, I think this may not be the case for the free tier servers, but most of the servers on EC2, they're not using a disk. They're using an SSD, which, unlike a disk, doesn't have a physical thing spinning, and we'll talk about storage systems after spring break. That's much less than 8 million nanoseconds, but it's still a lot more than 100 nanoseconds to get from main memory. After they set up the dashboard, the first thing that was really important to improve healthcare.gov, this is the, the lowest hanging fruit, was to add caching. And this reduced the page load time from 8 seconds to 2. 2 seconds is still an appallingly high page load time. Like, people don't stay around websites that take 2 seconds to load, but at least that's a factor of 4 improvement just by caching. The difficulty in caching is you've got to know that the cache is up to date. With a web server, if you're getting a lot of requests, you're probably OK if you just say, if it's within a few seconds, it's probably valid. And you don't have to worry about checking if that data has changed. If you're doing database queries, well, then you've got to be careful to figure out, is this something where you need an up-to-date result, or how long can you cache it for? So the other strategy that two of you mentioned is getting more resources. You can get more resources by getting one machine that's faster. That's really expensive, usually to get one machine that's super fast. The easier way to do that, and the easier way to do that more quickly, is to get more servers. That means you've got to design your service so it can run on many servers. So we'll look at Amazon's EC2. There are many other ways to get more servers. But if you are actually paying for it instead of the free tier, what you're getting is a machine with SSDs in it, and it is costing you about 10 cents per hour for each machine. So you can easily ramp up if you need you know, 100 extra machines for an hour. That's going to cost you $11. The costs depend on where the machine is. Here we have Virginia, nice and cheap at $0.11. Cents. California, $0.12. Cents. And Tokyo is $0.17 cents an hour. Why do the costs vary depending on where the machine is? Yes. OK, good. Yes. Different cost for power is probably the biggest thing, but it's also different cost for space, for people. Lots of things are different between different countries. So if this is the case, why does anyone buy machines in Tokyo or California? Shouldn't everyone just buy all their machines in Virginia? If Virginia's got nice cheap energy and cheap people and everything else that makes it cheap to run, run servers. Yeah. Latency, good. Yeah, so if you want to serve customers that are in Tokyo, you don't want them having to send a packet all the way to Virginia and back. So it is worth it for people running web services that care about latency to pay the extra 60 cents an hour, uh, sorry, the extra 6 cents an hour to have their servers running in Tokyo instead of running in Northern Virginia. Luckily, your server is serving people mostly in Central Virginia, so it's pretty good to have it running in Northern Virginia. For Code Red, they were not running it on EC2. I think they had their, their own hardware, but they got more and that had a big impact on being able to handle more requests. It's not that easy to just have more servers. All the requests are coming in, maybe to the same place. What kinds of problems do you run into if you start sending them out to multiple different servers? Yes. Yeah. So there might be some shared state. Right? Most useful web services have some shared state. If someone comes in and creates an account, and then they come back, and their request gets sent to the wrong server that doesn't know about their account, that's pretty annoying. Right? They need to have shared state. And so what you need is some database that all the servers are sharing. Well, now you've got one resource again. So then maybe you want to scale the database. You can scale the database. You can have multiple replicated databases. But you've now got to do things to make sure the databases stay consistent. So all of these things pose new challenges. Luckily, today with cloud computing, a lot of these things you can outsource. You can use a database provided by AWS and not need to worry about doing replication yourself. You're going to get some performance guarantees or performance promises from that database. There are lots of ways to distribute a database. The most obvious one is just to replicate. You're going to have your database. You're going to have copies of it. They're all going to be the same. 
you're going to have them communicate in ways that keep the state up to date. This is great for reading. Each database has a copy of all the data, so you can do your read from any database you want. It's very difficult for writing. To do a write, you've got to do something that keeps the state consistent and know whether the state's consistent or not. The other strategies are to divide the data. So you can partition your data. So some of the data is in one database, some of it's in another. This saves the replication problem. The problem is now when you've got a request, you've got to know which database to go to. The two main ways to do that, you can split up by columns. So this would be you've got one database that has everyone's name and ID and another database that has their address. You could split by rows, which would mean you have one database that has all the information about some subset of your customers or your clients and another one that has all the information about another subset. Which one of these do we prefer? Let's say for healthcare.gov. Which kind of partitioning should they use? Yes. Number three, horizontal partitioning, yeah, which is, is also called sharding. This has the big advantage, right? If you know your requests are mostly based on particular users, well, you can partition your users into different databases. You could have a database that has all the users from California and a database that has all the users from Virginia. It's unlikely that a request is going to need to go to both of those. And if you know where the request is coming from, you're going to have a good chance of going to the right database and saving a lot of, a lot of trouble in being able to partition. And this is the kind of strategy that, that most big sites use. So Facebook will partition data based on people, but you've got to still know that unless everyone's friends are all in the same database, well, then you might have to send requests to other databases. So part of the design is to try to figure out enough about how you can group people, and that tends to be you know, a lot based on, at least in Facebook's case, you've already told them what network you're in. You can partition your database based on those things, and most of the things people need to see are in the same database. The other strategy, which is fairly popular, is just to give up. To say, we don't really care about keeping all our data consistent because we're running some silly web service that isn't keeping track of anything important like bitcoins. And if some people lose their bitcoins and others get their transactions messed up, that's sort of OK. It doesn't really need to be consistent. And it's a lot cheaper and easier to build a service by giving up on these things. So that's what a lot of modern web services do. And if, you know, if tiny percent of your transactions go bad and some customers are upset, that's sort of OK. Probably not such a good solution for healthcare.gov. Have we solved all our problems? We've got our dispatcher, we've got our servers, we've got our databases. Where's the bottleneck now? The dispatcher. That's the one thing that we haven't replicated. And if someone wants to attack us and has a botnet and can send all these requests to the dispatcher, it doesn't matter how well we do in everything after the dispatcher, our site's still going to go down. This happens pretty frequently. This is a distributed denial of service attack. You can buy these or you can pay for these services. It's not the most legitimate industry, but it exists and it's not that expensive. Whether it will bring a site down depends a lot on the site. There are differences in prices depending on where you want the machines. It costs a lot more to have your attack machines be in the US. This is both for latency and for getting through filters, but it's still pretty cheap. They are often politically motivated, sometimes financially motivated. Sometimes the attackers will try to blackmail the site owners and tell them, you know, if you don't pay us off, we're going to keep attacking your site. Our fourth strategy, and this is not really going to solve that problem, if we only have one dispatcher, we can still get overloaded. But at least we can do scheduling better. And this is one of the things you're doing for problems at three. And this is true whether you're being attacked or whether you're overloaded for any other reason. Right? If you have more requests coming in than you can serve, or you want to get better response rates for people, then you've got to do scheduling in a smart way. What should the goal of the server be? So let's say you knew in advance all the requests that are going to come in, and you are tasked with coming up with an ideal schedule for them. What, what should your schedule be? So when we talked about operating system scheduling, we said our, our main goals were resource maximization, and this was low switching was the way to get that, but also doing smart things about energy and time. And our other goal was fairness, which was a little fuzzy to define, but meant that we're going to give more resources to high priority processes, but make sure that nothing that should get some time starves completely. Are the goals for our web server scheduling the same? Are there any things that should be different? What's the starvation issue like for web servers? So he said, with an operating system, we don't want to starve a process because we want them to all make some progress. How should we be thinking about fairness for a web server? Should we be thinking about fairness? Yeah. So we're worried about if, if two people send a request to our web server and 
the first one gets their response after the second one, the first one's going to be upset that we didn't treat them fairly. Why not? Do we care about disparity? Good. Yeah, so we certainly don't want to waste time on requests where the response is going to be back so late that the browser who made the request has already moved on and doesn't care about the response anymore. They've gone to some other page. So what does that say about fairness? Do we really care about fairness? Yeah, so we care about what visitors perceive. And fairness is probably, probably no site wants to say as a marketing strategy that we're not fair because there's this sense that you're supposed to be fair. But fairness is a pretty strange goal for a web server. If fairness means everybody's request, say this is half a second, if fairness was to make every request take half a second, then the majority of your customers are probably leaving and not happy. If you can instead do this, make a bunch of requests quick, and either drop or make really slow the others, this is probably better. Fairness is not really your goal. If your goal is to have the largest number of happy visitors you can, fairness is really against that. What you want is to find some way to do scheduling that gets the largest number of people quick responses. What is the main bottleneck to that? So if we're going to work on optimizing performance, we've got to figure out what is the main bottleneck to it. And measurement is the way to do that. What do you expect the main bottleneck to performance of your, your Zeta server is? Yes. Yeah, so before you add the cache, before the cache, it's probably disk I.O. Let's assume you've solved problem, I don't know, problem five, problem six, whichever one was to implement a cache and you did it in a really good way. So now very few requests need to go to the disk. What is your main bottleneck now? What are the possible bottlenecks once you've solved the disk I.O. problem? The CPU, okay, so there's a CPU. Do we think the CPU is the main bottleneck? Actually, we should have some other candidates before we decide if the CPU is the main one. What are other possible bottlenecks? Yeah, the network, okay. So if there's a limited number of bytes we can send at a time on the network, limited bandwidth. Which bottleneck do we think is gonna be most important? Network, okay, good. Yes, yeah, so the CPU really doesn't have too much to do, especially for our simple server, but this is the case for almost all web services. There's very little processing to do, and processes are super fast. Right? If your CPU is your main bottleneck, that's really easy to solve you get a CPU with more cores, or you turn optimization on when you compile your code. I don't know how many of you use the, the dash O flag when you compile your Zeta server. It probably will have very little impact on your performance, but it's a free way to, to make, make sure the CPU is not the bottleneck. But the network bandwidth is probably the main bottleneck. You have a limited amount of network bandwidth. That bandwidth is given to you. you know, your server is connected to some ISP, and that ISP is connected to the internet. And all of these pipes have some limited amount of bandwidth. And depending on who's hosting your server and how much you're paying them, you're getting some share of that. So this is what you're getting with Linode. With AWS, it's harder to understand what you're getting, and it's not that, that clearly documented. But Linode gives you a nice diagram. They've got these big pipes that go to the core of the data center. They've got these routers. Right? Each one of these is about $100,000. Supports 48 gigabits per second per slot. So there are 10 slots, so that's uh, 480 gigabits per second. Then there are a bunch of switches, and then your server is sitting down here after all those, and you're getting, if you're paying $20 a month, you're only getting 250 megabits per second. That's the big limit. And if you pay more, you can get more. But ultimately, you're limited by the size of all these pipes. That's your most limited resource for your server once you've solved the I.O. caching problem, the disk caching problem. One of the papers that's linked from problem set three is the strategy of shortest remaining processing time first. When you've got a web server under overload, they are arguing that you don't want fair. What you really want is unfair scheduling. Marking your scheduler as unfair is sort of like marking it as the, the big O and scheduler. It's not very smart for marketing because people like fairness. So instead of calling it unfair, it's the shortest remaining processing time first. But in some sense, that's the very opposite of fairness. Right? It's saying, Instead of giving the request that has been waiting the longest the chance to run first, you're going to have the request that's closest to finishing, which may well be a request that has not been waiting that long, just one that doesn't require a lot of resources. This is the way they do that. So what they had to do in that paper actually modified the Linux kernel. So they modified the kernel to instead of having one queue that feeds the network card, they had two queues. 
and they had one queue with higher priority, and if there was any packet waiting to go in that queue, that would go first. Otherwise, it would draw packets from the second priority queue. For problem set three, you're not expected to modify the kernel. Um, if you want to modify the kernel, you're certainly welcome to. After spring break, we will get into modifying the kernel. How close can you get to this in problem set three if you don't modify the kernel? What are all the things that you don't have control over? So when, once you send a packet, packet you, you call the function to send a packet, do you have any control over how the OS schedules when that packet actually gets sent? You're totally reliant on the OS. You're using whatever the standard scheduler is, you're doing a send, putting some packets in that queue, it's totally up to the underlying operating system how to implement that. You've lost all control. You hope it's giving your packets the priority you want, but you don't have any control over that. What about the CPU? Do you have any control over how your task gets scheduled on the CPU? So once you spawn a task, do you have any control over how that task gets scheduled? So that's up to the Rust scheduler. So unless you modify the Rust scheduler, you don't have any control over how that task gets scheduled. And unless you modify the underlying OS scheduler, you don't have any control over how the Rust process that includes your task gets scheduled. Once you do a spawn, you've also lost control. All of those things are now up to the operating system or the Rust scheduler. So the only way you have control is if you do things before they get launched. So the way you have control is you can decide when the sends happen and when the spawns happen. You can delay sends. Once you do a send, you've lost control over that. In order to have control over your scheduling, you've got to not do these things until you want to. Once you've done those things, you've given control to the Rust scheduler and the OS. And they probably do a pretty good job. You hope they do a good job, but they don't know about your application. Right? They're scheduling everything based on what little they know about what those applications want. So to have more control, you've got to delay when those things happen. I hope people will find interesting things to do for Palm Set 3. I hope we'll see several solutions faster than Apache, at least for our benchmark.